Hi, everyone. Oh. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Emma Cooksey. I'm here for tonight's story sharing, um, which is going to be really exciting. So I'm here with Kristen, who I'm going to introduce in a little while. So normally you see Julie Flygar um, introducing these, but I was really excited to pop on today to introduce Kristen because I already know her. <laughs> Um, so if you don't know me, I'm the host of the Sleep Apnea Stories podcast, and I'm also a board member at Project Sleep. And um, so I just love all the work that they do, and I am really excited to support them any way I can. I also took part in the Rising Voices program. So I did the speaker training, and I went through exactly what Kristen's doing tonight of sharing my story. And I just think it's so powerful hearing people's stories um, direct in their own words, you know, so I hope that you're really going to enjoy tonight. Um, so a couple of things before I properly introduce Kristen. So tonight, oftentimes when people are tuning in, um, it might be because they have some sim symptoms that they've noticed that, you know, they want to find out more about sleep disorders. So it could be that Kristen says things that you really relate to and you think, hmm, that could be me. So it's just to say that there's no medical advice tonight. So if you find yourself in that situation, you're going to want to raise those concerns with your own doctor. Um, another thing is we're recording tonight's video. So any of the comments or the questions you put um, will stay with this video and will be available to the public. So just don't share anything um, personal that you wouldn't want to be available, like, you know, to the whole public. Um, and the other thing is we would love, we're going to do a little um, Q&A at the end. I'm going to make sure and ask Kristen any of your questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and put those in the comments and I'll monitor those as she talks. And at the end, we can ask her all your questions and have a little discussion. So let me go ahead and introduce Kristen Cassio. So... Kristen Cassio is a clinical social worker and a world traveler from Boston. She was diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea at the age of 31 and now hopes to raise awareness while encouraging others to never feel self-conscious about their diagnosis. As a speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices program, Kristen shares her story to increase public knowledge around sleep apnea diagnosis and treatment. So if you want to put your slides up, Kristen, we can get you started. Sounds great. Thank you, Emma. Let me just get my screen going here. Thank you so much, Emma, for introducing me and for having me here. And thank you also to Project Sleep. I'm here to share my story. So let's get started. Growing up, I grew up in a suburb south of Boston. I'm the second of four children, and we spent our summers with all of our cousins on Cape Cod. This included lots of games of capture the flag, wiffle ball, and hours spent in my aunt's pool. The first picture on this slide is of my sister and I in elementary school. We're one year apart, so we were always close. I was always kind of quiet growing up, but I started to find myself when I joined my high school theater's tech crew. I met so many friends during this experience that I'm still close with to this day. I do not have any musical or acting talent whatsoever, so my contributions were to the props crew. My friends and I would run around backstage setting up the sets. This middle picture is of my best friend and I with dresses that we found in the school's props closet. I think we wore those over our clothes all day. Early on in high school, I started becoming very curious about the world, started dreaming about traveling. I remember the first travel book I ever bought in ninth grade, which I still have and is pictured here, was about museums and galleries of London. I slowly started buying more travel books, watching travel shows, and I promised myself I would study abroad someday. I remember I first started noticing that I had low energy most days when I was around 15 or 16 years old. At that time, 
I figured it was just because teenagers need more sleep and I had to get up early for school, earlier than I would have liked. By the time I was 18 and in college, I was already used to dealing with low energy and sleeping a lot. I also woke up with headaches regularly, but I was often rushing out of my house to get to work or school, so I didn't give those a second thought. Most of the time, I could stop myself from falling asleep during important events. I would do this by counting down how long I had until I could get home and take a nap, bouncing my legs up and down, or drinking lots of cold water. I would plan to take a nap as soon as I got home, so I would kind of will myself to just get to that point. I went to Clark University in Worcester, Mass., which is known for its psychology program, and I always knew that's what I wanted to study. Here's a picture of me with the statue of Sigmund Freud that's in the main square of campus. That's how into psychology this university is. I was so excited to have gotten into an abnormal psychology class my sophomore year. I remember one day I was sitting in the front row and we were reviewing symptoms of certain mental health conditions. There was some mention of abnormal sleepiness and sleeping through work. I remember feeling so overcome with sleepiness myself while we were going through the lecture. I was trying to stay awake using all my typical strategies, but I just couldn't. My head nodding started and I began slumping down in my chair. I know that I only fell asleep for a few seconds at a time and maybe the professor didn't even notice, but I just remember thinking this was the worst possible time to be falling asleep. I started to worry that people would think there was something wrong with me. Why couldn't I stay up for an early afternoon class like everybody else could? Even though I was having a great time in college, studying psychology and having fun with my friends, my persistent low energy would frequently feel overwhelming. I coped by avoiding early morning classes and taking many six hour naps. One time later on during sophomore year of college, I was about 19 years old, I vividly remember a week of extreme fatigue and the disrupted sleep schedule that resulted from my attempts to cope. I was trying to study for my accounting final, but I started to fall asleep without exaggeration every time that I would try to read the book. It didn't matter where I read it. I could be in the library, in my dorm bed, or at the dorm kitchen table. Even if I didn't fall asleep in a public place, I would become so overcome with fatigue that I could feel my body being weighed down. I would feel this fog come over my brain and I wasn't able to take in the information that I was trying to read. I'd end up taking naps, but I never felt any better during that week. I had no choice but to push myself through. After I completed the final, my mom came to drive me home. When I got home, I told her I was gonna take a nap. It was probably 6 or 7 p.m. My nap turned into sleeping for 16 hours. I told myself I must have needed to catch up on sleep. And that became a routine for finals week for the rest of my college years. I was lucky enough to begin exploring the world by participating in two study abroad experiences in college. First, I went to Luxembourg for a summer program after my freshman year. And then I went to London for a semester in my junior year. The picture in the middle is of me in London and the picture on the right is my roommates and I when we studied abroad in London. This was from 2008 and we're still all friends to this day. After I graduated college, I began graduate school for social work when I was 22 years old. This is a picture of some of my books from my undergrad and grad programs. Once I was in grad school, I started to see that my peers really weren't struggling the way that I was with their energy levels. The program schedule included classes, unpaid internship hours, and I worked a variety of part-time jobs to have some money coming in. The most fun part-time job I had was as a party princess on the weekends. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures from that job to share. The biggest eye-opener to me during these years about my ability to function was the contrast between my routine and the routine of my now husband. We moved in together right before we started our second year at the same Masters of Social Work program. I remember that he didn't feel consistently overwhelmed because he didn't need to take naps most days like I did. 
he was able to finish his papers without staying up all night. He even had hobbies when I could barely get through my basic responsibilities. I used to think I was just a procrastinator, but I was actually fighting with fatigue and needing to take frequent naps. I know that I ended up with less free time during the day to complete my assignments, leaving me feeling frantic and forcing myself to stay up the night before they were due. We used to commute to the university, which was about a 45 minute drive into Boston, together every Wednesday. He had two classes in a row, but I only had one. His second class was from 5 to 7 p.m. Every week, I would bring a pillow and a blanket in the car with me, and I would take a nap in the car in the underground parking garage until he was done with his second class. Some of this time, it was the winter in Boston, so you can imagine I really shouldn't have been sleeping in my car, but I felt like I had no other choice. After his second class, we would get home, eat dinner, and I would almost always go right back to sleep. Despite my symptoms, I completed the program, and here's a picture of my husband and I at our graduation. It was pretty cool to be able to go through that together. My road to diagnosis started in my teenage years, and I brought up my low daily energy to doctors almost every chance that I could. I always knew something was off, but for years, the dots never connected. Depending on the doctor's specialty, we would try to figure out my low energy in different ways. I tracked my energy around things like my mood and my period. Then I would bring it back to the doctors, but no patterns would ever emerge. I was told repeatedly that it must be my lifestyle, but that never made sense to me. No matter how busy I was or wasn't, my fatigue was consistent. I also have a thyroid condition, an associated symptom is low energy. I think that's why my diagnosis was missed for so long. But I remember one time in my mid twenties, so I had been dealing with my fatigue for 10 years. I asked my endocrinologist at the time why I still felt so sleepy. My thyroid labs had been stable for several years. She told me some people just don't have a lot of energy. Once I heard this, I felt like I needed to accept that maybe this is just how I naturally exist in the world. I coped by making sure I got through my basic responsibilities, school and work, but social activities or hobbies were often replaced by naps. I got so used to my frequent naps and low energy, and I thought there was nothing I could do to solve it, so I might as well laugh about it. I found the planner in this picture on the left at TJ Maxx, and I had to buy it. It says, it's never too late to go back to bed. Due to an insurance change, I started seeing a new endocrinologist after about 10 years with my first provider. I was 29 years old and I had been out of grad school for four years. At first it was the same thing. My labs looked good, but my fatigue was persistent. It went on this way for another one to two years with this provider. Occasionally I would ask about my energy, but sometimes I just avoided the topic altogether. I had already been talking about it for so many years. After about a month of significantly low energy, in which I would go back to sleep for the night, immediately when I left work, I scheduled a follow-up appointment with her. I was so frustrated, and this felt like it had to become a turning point. To prepare for the appointment, I kept a log of my energy every day. This included how long I slept, my activities for the day, I wanted to show that there was more to this fatigue than just my lifestyle. I was working from home most days during this time. And on those days, all I did was walk from my room to my office and back. What about my lifestyle could have been the issue? Along with the data from my self-advocacy, my endocrinologist reviewed my labs, said to me, this 100% is not due to your thyroid. And luckily, she referred me to a sleep specialist. I wish I could say I felt hopeful, but I thought this might just be another dead end that wouldn't lead to any answers. When I got to the sleep specialist, I completed multiple questionnaires about my fatigue. I'd later come to find out that the symptom is called excessive daytime sleepiness. One of the scales is the Epworth sleepiness scale. 
This is where you rate your likelihood of dozing off during a variety of routine daytime activities. That's pictured here on the slide. I was 31 at the time of this appointment and working a non-strenuous nine to five from home. The doctor looked at my questionnaires, listened to my experiences and said to me, yeah, that's not normal. I couldn't believe I was finally being listened to. It makes such a difference. I started to feel like maybe I could find an answer. I was referred for an at-home sleep study, which ultimately led to my diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. I saw my results in my patient portal before I got a call from the doctor's office. That happens pretty frequently these days, but I couldn't believe it. I actually felt relief that there was an explanation with data to back it up of what I have been experiencing for all of these years. After a follow-up appointment with my doctor, I started on CPAP therapy. I had never heard of a young female with sleep apnea, so I didn't consider that's what could be going on. More importantly, I never would have guessed that I had a sleep disorder. I thought I was sleeping great every night. Turns out that many people with sleep apnea feel that way, which is one reason it's so important for us to know the facts about sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a serious sleep disorder that occurs when a person's breathing is interrupted during sleep. People with untreated sleep apnea stop breathing repeatedly during their sleep, sometimes hundreds of times a night. This means that the brain and the rest of the body may not get enough oxygen. Due to this lack of oxygen, sleep apnea increases the risk of serious and even life-threatening heart complications, such as stroke, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression. Sleep apnea affects people to varying degrees and can be mild, moderate, or severe. According to a 2014 publication by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, 25% or more of adults may be affected by sleep apnea to some degree. Symptoms of sleep apnea vary by person and may include sleepiness or a lack of energy during the day and or while driving, even after a full night's sleep. You might not be aware of it, but your breathing problems may wake you several times during the night. Remember my experiences in college where I would fall asleep when I was trying to complete work or I would nap for six hours. Those were examples of excessive daytime sleepiness. This was the most prominent symptom that I experienced. Loud snoring. It might come and go through the night and be loud enough to wake others near you. You may also wake up suddenly with a choking or gasping sensation. I wasn't aware that I had this symptom, but according to my husband, I did. At one time in my late 20s, he told me he heard me gasping for breath in my sleep. I followed up with my provider at the time, but that symptom unfortunately did not lead to any answers. Looking back, I would have followed up further, but I didn't know any facts about sleep apnea at that time. Another symptom is disrupted nighttime sleep, including restless sleep, repeated awakenings, or insomnia. I did not experience this symptom. Morning headaches and or dizziness. Scientists aren't sure why people with sleep apnea get these. It might be because of poor sleep or a lack of oxygen caused by the breathing problems. Before I understood that I had sleep apnea, I did not think twice about the headaches that I woke up with multiple times a week. I just accepted it as normal. There are a lot of things that you try to explain away when you're missing the real diagnosis of what's going on. I think for me, I struggled so much with my energy. I could never wake up early. So I was always rushed getting to work or to school. So I just pushed through my headaches. Waking up with a very sore or dry throat or dry mouth. This happens because apnea often causes you to breathe through your mouth. I didn't experience this symptom. Another symptom is nightmares. Some research has found a link between apnea and bad dreams, but more research is needed. I can't say that I experienced this symptom either. Finally, cognitive and mental health impacts are a symptom. Anxiety and depression are very common in people with sleep apnea, and lack of sleep can lead to forgetfulness, 
brain fog, and mood swings. Remember my example of studying for my accounting final? Even when I was trying to keep myself awake to study, I experienced brain fog that impacted my retention of information. I've had periods of my life where I've experienced depression. It's usually been triggered by feeling burned out from working in the mental health field. At those times, I didn't know that I had sleep apnea, but I knew that I had consistently low energy. Burnout and depression also lead to low energy, so it makes sense that there are mental health impacts associated with sleep apnea. There are two types of sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea. This is a more common of the two forms of apnea. It's caused by a blockage of the airway, usually when the soft tissue in the back of the throat collapses during sleep, and central sleep apnea. Unlike obstructive sleep apnea, in central sleep apnea, the airway is not blocked, but the brain fails to signal the muscles to breathe due to instability in the respiratory control center. My diagnosis is obstructive sleep apnea. Medical providers can diagnose sleep apnea using an in-lab sleep study, which typically includes measures of your brain waves, heart rate, breathing, and movement to determine a diagnosis. Sleep apnea can also be diagnosed using a home sleep apnea test, which allows you to sleep at home while a small monitor collects data. I had an at-home sleep study and all of the equipment was shipped to my house from the testing company. Sometimes the company will send someone to your home to help set up the equipment, but I had my study done in the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, so that wasn't possible. Luckily, I always fall asleep quickly because it was a little difficult to sleep with the equipment on. It included a sensor to put on one finger that monitors your oxygen levels, a mask with tubes that go into your nostrils, this was the weirdest part for me while sleeping, and a sensor for your chest to measure the rise and fall of your breathing. The next morning, I packed the equipment back up and the company had arranged for it to be picked up. It was really easy. It took a few weeks to get my results. The results showed a reading of my AHI, which stands for apnea hypopnea index. AHI represents the average number of apneas and hypopneas you experience each hour during sleep. My results showed that I have mild sleep apnea, but my symptoms were severe. The amount of impact of sleep apnea on daily symptoms can vary between people, no matter if their AHIs place them in the mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea diagnosis category. Considering that I first remember my symptoms of daytime sleepiness, brain fog, and headaches when I was 15 or 16 years old, my road to this diagnosis took about 15 years. The causes of sleep apnea vary between different people. There's no one size fits all treatment for this complicated condition. Symptom management varies widely by person, but may include various positive airway pressure or PAP devices, such as CPAP, AutoPAP, or BiPAP, which are prescribed to push air into the airway and keep it open at night. Oral appliances are made by dentists who specialize in sleep dentistry. These devices prevent your airway from collapsing by holding your tongue in position or by sliding your jaw forward. These are good alternatives for people with mild or moderate sleep apnea, but generally are not recommended for severe cases. For some people, the anatomical structure of their airway is a factor, and surgery to move the jaws forward and increase the width of the airway can resolve sleep apnea. Wakefulness medications are sometimes prescribed for people with excessive daytime sleepiness if they're using their CPAP every night as recommended. For some people, a large weight gain can be a cause of sleep apnea, and for those people, weight loss can improve or eradicate their symptoms. More research is needed, but other therapies people with sleep apnea find helpful include myofunctional therapy or positional therapy. Coping strategies vary widely by person, but may include social support, such as meetup groups or social media, and improvements in general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. 
for me, I've used a CPAP ever since I got my diagnosis and I had good success adjusting to it. I got a soft plastic pillow version of the cushion, which feels comfortable on my face at night. The biggest improvement that I've seen since using a CPAP is in my excessive daytime sleepiness. I can feel the difference now when I wake up. I actually feel rested. I still experience morning headaches, but they are much less frequent, maybe once a week instead of daily. I can also notice that my brain fog has almost completely lifted. My adjustments to my daily life with sleep apnea have been mostly positive. Even so, I remember being really overwhelmed when my CPAP supplies first arrived at my house. Ultimately, it is a really easy piece of equipment to use. But something about the box with all the parts and the manuals felt too much for me. Maybe I had gotten my hopes up and I didn't want to be disappointed if I didn't feel any better after using the CPAP. So part of me was hesitant to set it up. My husband was able to recognize what I needed at the time. And he supported me by learning how to use the equipment and setting it up for me for the first time. When I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, people in my life exclaimed that it made so much sense. Most people knew that I struggled with daytime sleepiness and that I loved to sleep. I still do. But finally, people could notice a difference in my everyday energy levels. My husband naturally wakes up very early on the weekends. And before I started using my CPAP, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed until 10 or 11. My family and I used to joke around and call it Mike's other life because he would get so much accomplished before I even woke up. Usually it would be catching up on his hobbies, like books he wanted to read or movies that he knew I wouldn't want to watch. But now he's had to adjust to me being around. Just kidding. It's given us more quality time together now that I can wake up earlier and I don't feel overwhelmed by errands that I want to get to on the weekends. On the right is a picture of us on a hike in the Berkshires one fall, I'm sorry, on the left. Professionally, I find that I am less likely to feel burned out in my job. I'm a clinical social worker and I've had a variety of emotionally taxing jobs in the field. I think that the power of sleep and having the appropriate energy to get through my day has helped me to cope with the stressors of my job. I also don't feel like my job is the majority of my life anymore. Remember how I used to frequently go to sleep right after school or work, leaving me minimal time for any activities of my choosing. I'm happy to say that that rarely happens these days. Over time, I started to view my CPAP as a tool that allows me to live a fuller life. Remember my love of travel that began in high school? My sleep apnea has not stopped me from where I wanna go. I started an Instagram account you can see a screenshot of it pictured here, to track my travels with my CPAP. It started out just as a way to amuse myself while carrying my little CPAP case around on trips with me, but I ended up connecting with a community of people with sleep disorders, which led me to Project Sleep. I've started participating in Project Sleep's advocacy events, like their annual Sleep In to raise awareness. I love getting messages from people who say they didn't think they'd be able to travel with their CPAP, and now they know that they can. Speaking of traveling, I've gone to some pretty cool destinations since having my CPAP. I can get more out of my days because of the overall improvements that I've experienced in my daytime sleepiness and my brain fog. I spent an amazing three weeks in Peru and I got to enjoy the scenery during my travels instead of sleeping on every plane, train, or bus ride. While I was in Peru, I completed two challenging hikes. One was up to 17,000 feet elevation to Rainbow Mountain, and another to the peak of Huayna Picchu, which is the taller mountain that you can see behind pictures of Machu Picchu. That's a picture on the left of this slide. If you look really closely, you can see the entire ancient city of Machu Picchu behind the clouds. I remember that I had to be awake at 4 a.m for my transportation to my hike to Rainbow Mountain. I still prioritize my sleep, so I went to bed by 9 p.m. the night before. But I remember actually feeling awake for the 4 a.m. bus ride. I couldn't believe it. I got to see the scenery of rural Peru that I know I would have slept through before getting my diagnosis. On the right is a picture of me with some alpacas 
on the way up Rainbow Mountain. In the middle is a picture of my CPAP in a really cool hotel room that I had when I went to Croatia. Since starting treatment for sleep apnea, I've been able to be more present in my life. It's a relief to not constantly feel worried about making plans in the future. The what if I'm too tired to do A, B, or C feeling has mostly lifted. Looking back on the years that I went undiagnosed with sleep apnea makes me really appreciate everything that I've accomplished. I'd like for everyone who's struggling with their energy or with an undiagnosed sleep disorder to know that you're accomplishing so much despite your symptoms. I'm never self-conscious about using my CPAP. I've even used it in shared hostel rooms because I want to encourage others to not feel shame around their diagnosis. Because of myths and misperceptions surrounding sleep apnea, many people with this serious sleep disorder have not been diagnosed or received treatment. One study showed an average of a seven year delay between the time a person with sleep apnea recognizes one or more of their symptoms and when they receive a referral for a sleep study. You do not have to be older, male, or obese to have sleep apnea. You don't even have to snore. Anyone, including children and young adults, can be affected. My journey to a diagnosis spanned 15 years. It's important for me to raise awareness of obstructive sleep apnea so that others don't have to wait so long for treatment. I spent my adult life explaining away my fatigue when it actually had a medical cause. Despite that, I had a personally and professionally fulfilling 15 years that gives me hope that things can only continue positively in the future. I've shared my story today as part of Rising Voices, a program of the nonprofit organization Project Sleep, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of sleep disorders. Thank you all for listening to my story. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thanks, sharing Emma. that. I love it so much. So um, I have so many questions for you. <laughs> I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a lot of people just saying how much they can relate to your story in the comments. I bet. Um, and so I feel like you probably answered it. Somebody had asked, like, how do you feel like you're doing now um, with your sleep apnea and which treatment worked best for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, now I, I feel like I'm doing so well. Like I said, luckily I, I adjusted really well to using my CPAP. So that's the only thing that I've ever used. I haven't tried any other sleep treatments. I'm a little attached to my CPAP now, if I'm being honest, because it's made well, such you have a difference. all of your travel. Like, <laughs> yeah. So for any of you that hasn't followed Kristen on Instagram, she has an Instagram account called me and my CPAP. Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And she has these really great, um, so if anybody out there has the CPAP, you'll know that the um, case that it comes in is kind of like just this like gray, really standard case, but you have all sorts of um, stickers and patches, patches like so yeah. on for all the places you've been. I love that. Yeah, that's always my souvenir everywhere that I go. I always go and find a patch. I've been successful. There was only one place that I couldn't find one. So I had to order it online, but I'm always scoping out for patches. Yeah. yeah so I love I that love every time I get on a plane, I'm like, I look at my CPAP you case and I'm like, I should really do yeah. what Kristen's doing. Yeah, you should. So, yeah. So yeah. I had a ton of things that I wanted to ask you a little bit more about. Like, I think that, um, one of the things I love that you said was you saw a contrast between your husband's routine and your routine mm -hmm. and how different that looked. Like, I think that that's so powerful because I feel like there's so many um, similarities between your story and my story. Um, but one of the times in my life where I really was like, there's something wrong with my sleep was after like, you know, quite a lot of years in my 20s feeling like well I do nap a lot and I am really tired all the time but when I moved in with my husband it was such a stark contrast that it was yeah. really difficult to not notice you know yeah. that he was like you said about your husband up at the crack of dawn <laughs> yeah so do you think before that you had been telling yourself well maybe this is normal and and that just helped you know really 
show you that it wasn't? I think so. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on. So one, like when I was in college, you don't really have a standard routine, or at least I didn't. Like you'd have your classes at all different times. And then I'd always say, like, I worked at the library. I worked random hours. So you kind of can explain it away. Like why I you were so tired. Too. We have That's so, much so strange. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I think like after college, um, I started like working and having a more like typical nine to five schedule around sort of the same time that my husband and I started dating, but we weren't living together yet. So it still was kind of hard to know. Maybe I just was more tired than him. Um, yeah. So it definitely did highlight it once we started like actually not only living together, but we were in the same exact graduate school program. So it was kind of hard to just right. it's say, oh, I must just be so tired. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And have the plus, same schedule. Yeah, honestly, I think for a long time, um, you know, what I did have one physician tell me that some people just don't have a lot of energy. I I really bought into that for many, many years, honestly. Um, yeah. So I don't know if people can relate to that. And so I think the timing between when I started to question it again, it had been a couple of years since I heard that from the doctor. And I just kind of started thinking again, this can't be right at the same time that Mike and, and I tell me thinking. about how you so so with my experiences early on it probably took me more than 10 years to get a diagnosis and I feel like early on I went to so many doctors and was just like I'm so tired all the time and I you know no matter how much I sleep I never feel like I got a great night's sleep and you know and they just would kind of explain it all different ways and I would be like okay then and, and kind of go away so looking back is there anything you you would advise other people to do differently I know for me um a lot of the the words that I used when I went to the doctor early on were tired and exhausted and I, I didn't I hadn't even heard of excessive daytime sleepiness but if someone had said that to me I would have been like that's exactly what yeah. this feels like yeah. So is there anything that, that looking back that, that, you know, if there's people listening who are in the same situation we were in trying to get a diagnosis, is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if anybody is here listening, they're already way ahead of like where you and I were, because yeah. I think oh, it's the language, yeah. like, and what we didn't yeah. know, you don't know what you don't know at the time. So it's the same thing. I would just always say, I don't have any energy. I don't, I'm tired. I don't have any energy. And there's so many other things that can be the cause of yes. low energy. So if I had known about the term excessive daytime sleepiness, I think that might've just piqued a doctor's interest a little bit more, but I didn't know what to say. And I don't even think I yeah. ever said, which is kind of strange, like looking back because the number one thing that I felt was every morning I wake up, I felt like I didn't sleep at all, but I don't really think I ever said that, you know, I would just kind right. of like conceptualize it as low energy. So I think, I think there's a lot of things that, that, um, I realized later sort of looking back, I was like, oh, I had terrible morning headaches. <laughs> I, you know, like all these things, but I didn't think to tell a doctor because I didn't really know that they linked together, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of funny when you look back in retrospect. Um, and the other thing, like, so your whole story about like taking naps in the freezing cold in the middle of winter in Boston, yeah. like that just, to me, is just like, you just do what you've got to do at the time, right? To make yeah. it through. That's exactly it. You like, you have no other, I felt like I had no other choice. I was so tired that it was like, it feels like it comes over you. Like I could have sat yeah. there and forced myself to stay awake in the student center or something, but I it would have been this non-productive time for me. And I was even just chatting with my friends before I popped on this and remembering back that when I had a job um, like after graduate school, so I was probably like 27 or 28, there would be some days I had to commute there. This was before the work from home days. And I would go and take a nap in my car like during my break and then come back in because I was just so tired. And I didn't really yeah. remember that because you do like you have no other choice but to keep going. So yeah. I you just kind of like feel like, OK, this is the situation I'm yeah. in. So I'm, I, I had like my early 20s. I had a lot of office jobs where I can remember like after lunch, just really struggling <laughs> to yeah. stay awake, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so, which I actually yeah. on that scale, if anyone ever, and you could look it up, that F word sleepiness scale, I do remember yeah. I kind of like laughed to myself when you have to rate the likelihood that you'd fall asleep. And it, one of the questions is like, 
right after you eat lunch. And I was like, oh my God, that's the top of the chart. I would definitely yeah, fall asleep definitely. if I could. And so one of the other things I wanted to kind of tease out for people is um, you were talking about having mild sleep apnea, but having quite severe symptoms. Mm -hmm. So can you just kind of like talk a little bit to that? Like, I feel like I talk to people oftentimes on my podcast and they'll say, well, I had a sleep test, but it was very mild. And so they're not then getting any treatment, but can you talk a little bit to how having mild like, you know, sleep apnea in your test doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that you have mild symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the important thing about that, if people do have mild sleep apnea, but they don't want to seek out the treatment is that I still have had a huge difference when I went for my first year checkup for my CPAP, my sleep study showed um, just under 10 events every hour, which is still a lot I think every hour, I know other people can go much higher, but 10 times yeah. you're waking yourself up without realizing it every single yeah. hour, that's every six minutes. So then I went from 10 down to like 1.7 events after my first year of using yeah. a CPAP. So that makes a huge difference, but huge I don't know difference. exactly what goes with, like, I don't know why there's not really an association, but for me, I have, right. I would say really severe symptoms that impacted me almost every single day so I think and the I don't main have those for, now yeah I think the main thing for people listening is just to um you know tell your doctor what's going on mm -hmm. and and really you know like with you rather than I think I think doctors are pretty good now at looking at you know treating the patient and not just looking at numbers mm -hmm. but it is important just to explain like how this is affecting your life so that they can get a full picture of what's happening definitely and and even if the other thing I was going to say was a lot of people are really put off doing testing for sleep apnea because they think like it's going to be really cumbersome and hard so do you want to just kind of uh talk to that a little bit about how so so your test actually came to your home yeah and you did it all at home yeah. Yeah. It was really easy. And they started out, at least the way it was explained to me was you start out with a home sleep study. And then if that gives the doctor all the data that they need to make a diagnosis, then that's it. But if it somehow didn't give you the data, then you might have to go do a lab sleep study yeah. to follow up. But it was really easy. I mean, the people called me, they explained exactly what was coming. It was like a tracked delivery. So I knew exactly when it was going to get there. Um, it's only a couple pieces. It was less intimidating than opening my actual CPAP box the first time. Right. I'll say There's only like three little pieces of equipment that you have to attach to yourself. And yeah. then you just pack it right back up. And so you had something up. on your finger, you said, yeah. and a a thing stuck here yeah something like over your, chest. Up your nose or no yeah the thing yeah. that goes up your nose that that was the strangest thing for me so that's how I knew when I had to get a CPAP that I wasn't going to get one of those masks I knew yeah. I needed to find a Not different one that's okay yeah but I think I think sometimes it's good for people to hear that testing has come a long way mm -hmm. and you know it could be that that you still a lot of people still need an in-lab study and that's because they can get the most data. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes, especially when you talk to, you know, um, people whose partner they're, you know, like I talk to people all the time where they're hearing their partner stop breathing and they're like, oh. And so I think that sometimes it's easier to sell somebody on. It's probably just going to be a home test because yeah. it sounds a lot easier and then people can find out what's going on. Yeah. And I think I remember that they said they recommend to like keep your normal bedtime routine, go to bed the same time that you're going to, like, you don't have to do anything different yeah. for the test. They want you to do things typically. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, yeah. And I was just going to say as well, I love that your husband supported you in um, <laughs> setting up your equipment. Yeah. So is there like I think I think sometimes like when I started using my CPAP, I think my husband felt a little bit like there's nothing really you know, like there was nothing he could do to help, but that is a practical thing people can do to help. 
Yeah, to definitely. actually read all the instructions and help set it yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they don't have, it's not as loaded for them, right? Like I really was kind of, yeah. I sort of got my hopes up, but I, and but then what if it didn't work? So I was really hesitant, but for him, he's yeah. like, is this is just some piece of equipment. And he is very um technical anyway. So it was easy for him to set it up, but yeah, it was a really nice thing. I would have eventually done it, but it was nicer and easier. Yeah, that's awesome. Me. I love that. Yeah. Well, listen, I loved your presentation. I thought that was wonderful and um tell people a little bit about where they can find you yeah I would love if people could check out and follow me on Instagram me and my CPAP is the name of my Instagram account and I post pictures of my travels I'm actually if you can't tell in a hotel right now so I'm off um, which is super on brand for you <laughs> I know. So uh, I just kind of post pictures of like um, the places that I go. I've gone to several international destinations too, as well as a lot of just local. I mean, I'm in New Hampshire right now, so I'm not too far from home. Um, but it's all, it's been really great. Truly. I didn't anticipate connecting with people like Emma and people like from Project Sleep. So it's been a yeah. nice community of people over on Instagram. So come awesome. on over. Well, thank you for sharing your story. I know that it makes a huge difference just for people to see young women with sleep apnea talking about it is huge. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you, Kristen. And thank you everybody for watching and have a really great night and we'll see you soon. Thanks, bye.